You can walk from here to the hospital, right Jessica? My husband Mark said this as he incredulously helped our daughter Jessica out of the car. To my surprise, my mother-in-law Sandra casually took the passenger seat, and Mark settled into the driver's. Well, that settles it. I made up with Dad. We're off to enjoy a reconciliation trip to Hawaii, just the three of us. With those words, they drove away. What just happened? I was so shocked by the abruptness of it all, I was at a loss for words. I'm sorry. Jessica's hoarse voice snapped me back to reality. Suddenly, nothing else mattered, and I immediately hailed a taxi to take Jessica to the hospital. That was all I could focus on. And I was burning with a rage I vowed never to quench. Mark and his mother had no idea I could take such bold action. In my heart, I swore revenge on them for disregarding our family. My name is Linda. I'm 42 years old and work as a nurse. My husband Mark is 45, just an ordinary office worker. Our daughter Jessica, just turned 10, is a quiet girl who prefers reading alone at home or during school breaks. Given my profession, I rarely mingled with the opposite sex, and I was so focused on my career that I never even attended parties. Then, just as I turned 30, a friend insisted on not going to a singles party alone because she was nervous, though I wasn't interested, I decided to accompany her. That's where I met Mark. He laughed about prioritizing work over his personal life and somehow missing the chance to marry. I felt a strange kinship, and before I knew it, we had exchanged contact information. Talking to him, I found him to be a kind man, dedicated to his work, with a stable income. He was understanding of my irregular nursing hours, and there was no denying I was drawn to him. He felt the same. I want to know more about you, Linda. I was thrilled by those words. Thus, we began to grow closer, entering into a relationship with marriage in mind, and we got married when I was 31. Almost simultaneously with our marriage, I got pregnant with Jessica and gave birth at the age of 32. We both agreed that one child was enough, so we didn't try for more. Ten years have passed, and now, an appalling menace looms over me. One day, Mark blurted out something unexpected. Mom is coming over tomorrow. So, yeah, please take care of that. His sudden declaration of cohabitation left me reeling. What do you mean? I'm caught off guard with your mother suddenly coming to stay. I asked, my voice strangely high-pitched, seeking an explanation. According to him, it seemed there had been a fierce argument between his father, Daniel, and his mother, Sandra, during which Sandra declared she was leaving and began packing her bags. Naturally, the only place for her, in her sixties, to go was to her son Mark's. That's why she suddenly announced she would be coming to our house the next day. Honestly, I had always thought cohabiting, even with one's own parents, was impossible. I protested strongly. Just because you had an argument with your father, you're coming to our house as if running away? What about our circumstances? Please, reconsider. He seemed particularly displeased with my retort, replying with a disgruntled face. Is living with my mom that unbearable? I never thought you could be so cold. I couldn't bring myself to say of course it was. His expression was too intimidating. And I shrank back, swallowing the words I had almost said, instead glaring back at him. Thinking I wouldn't retort, he looked smug. Don't bother resisting from the start. Just get the room ready for mom to use. He said. First of all, this house is rented, so we'd need permission from the owner or management company to add another occupant. The lease is in my name because I get a housing allowance, so naturally, it would be up to me to handle this. With three of us living here, one room is used by Jessica, and the other is our bedroom. There's no spare room available under the current circumstances. I said this, and to my amazement, 
he responded with a calm demeanor. Then, let's move Jessica to the living room for her studies and such. It'll also allow us to make sure she's doing her homework, and I think that's a good idea. She's still in elementary school, after all, she doesn't really need her own room. So, Jessica will be spending her time in the living room for a while. His appalling rationale made me dizzy. Why would you say something like that? Do you prioritize your mother over your own daughter? Huh? I didn't exactly say that, but I do owe a lot to mom for raising me. So, that's the situation. He said as if it were the most natural thing. Despite my protests, his mind was made up. As soon as Jessica returned, your room will be grandma's from now on. So, start cleaning it out right away. He told her. I rushed to intervene, but Jessica said, It's okay. And began moving her belongings to the living room. Watching her from behind, my heart ached, and at the same time, my hatred for him seemed to swell. Lately, he had not been contributing to the household chores or finances, and his return home had been growing later and later. I had been patient because Jessica was only 10, but today's attitude seemed to make my decision clear. And the next day, as scheduled, Sandra arrived at our house in the evening and began yelling. What is this room? Mark, are you sane? Expecting someone to live here is ridiculous. Just as Sandra arrived, our neighbor was returning home too, casting curious glances our way, prompting me to apologize hurriedly. Upon contacting the management company, I was told that no special procedures were necessary for a short-term stay, just a report was enough. So, honestly, I was hoping Sandra could return home as soon as possible, ideally within two weeks. However, my wish was shattered. First, there was the large suitcase Sandra brought, indicating she planned to stay at least a month, which was disheartening. Sandra, ignoring me, entered the room unabashedly, looking around as if surveying the place. Then she opened the refrigerator without permission. What is this? There's nothing in the fridge. Do you think Mark and your granddaughter can get any nutrition from this? Linda, you're really useless, was her immediate criticism. I was planning to go grocery shopping today, but Sandra's sudden arrival meant I had to clean up right after work, leaving no time to shop. Should I order delivery in such cases? Lately, Mark prefers delivery over my cooking, constantly making sarcastic comments, and I've just been dealing with it. Sandra, shall we order something for delivery today? I asked, forcing a smile. Yet, Sandra complained even about this. Huh? I won't allow delivery. A mother or wife who doesn't cook is worthless. Go shopping right now and make sure you prepare both dinner and dessert. After saying this, she threw her purse at me and slammed the door shut. Soon, the sound of the TV blasting and Sandra's loud laughter from inside made me sigh, I couldn't even count how many times. An hour later, after shopping, I returned and was shocked to see the living room. Jessica had come home while I was out and was doing her homework in the living room with Sandra watching over her like a demon. Whenever she made a mistake, that's not right. Or, how can you not understand? Such a useless child. I wonder who she takes after. She would shout. I hurriedly intervened. She just started learning this recently. Besides, elementary schools now teach foreign languages and programming. It's wrong to judge by old values. I defended her, but Sandra, uninterested in my words, said, If only she were more like her intelligent father, implying a derogatory view of both Jessica and me. Seeing Jessica's downcast face, I quickly reassured her. It's okay, Jessica. You just go at your own pace. While saying this, I glared sternly at Sandra. 
However, she wasn't listening, and, upset by my retort, she started snacking on her own. Then, a week after her arrival, my frustration was about to explode. I complained to Mark. I can't take this anymore. Do something about Sandra. It's one thing for me to be criticized, but it's unfair to Jessica. Mark replied with an annoyed tone. What? Don't act so high and mighty when you're getting help with the housework. It's Jessica's fault for not being able to study, right? Like her not-so-smart mother, Jessica is the real victim here. I was furious and couldn't hold back any longer. Usually, I would end the conversation to avoid trouble, but hearing Jessica being spoken about like that hurt me as a mother. And Sandra only acted kind to me in front of Mark. When I was busy, she'd approach with a laugh. Sit down and have some tea, Linda. I'll take care of the rest. Pretending to do the housework. But in reality, doing nothing, leaving everything to me. Despite this, Mark was oblivious. Thinking Sandra was helping me. I confronted Mark with my accumulated frustrations. So, your priority is not Jessica but your mother. You're okay with your daughter being unfairly criticized by Sandra? I couldn't stand it if my mother did that. He taunted me with a laugh. Yeah. Mom is always right. Well, unlike me, who graduated from college, you only finished nursing school. It's no wonder Jessica can't do well in studies or sports. Poor her. I felt something snap inside me, but instead of getting angry. Right, understood. I laughed it off. A month later, Jessica, who usually wakes up early even on weekends, was still wrapped in her blanket, not getting up. When I asked her, I feel sick. She said, Recalling a recent outbreak at school, I checked her temperature 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Rushing to tell Mark, I found him preparing to leave. Shocked, I froze, and he said as if it were obvious. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I'm going to Hawaii with Dad and Mom. I had never heard such plans, but at that moment, I didn't care. Usually, Mark commutes by train, so the only car we have is mine. Ignoring Mark, I was about to take Jessica to the hospital open on weekends, when Mark and Sandra approached, dragging their suitcases, and then said something unbelievable. You can walk from here to the hospital, right Jessica? Mark said this as he incredulously helped Jessica out of the car. To my surprise, Sandra casually took the passenger seat, and Mark sat down in the driver's seat. Well, that's how it is. We've made up with Daniel, so we're off to enjoy a family trip to Hawaii, just the three of us. And with those words, they drove off. Stunned by the sudden turn of events. I'm sorry. I was brought back to reality when Jessica said, in a hoarse voice. Suddenly, nothing else mattered, and I immediately hailed a taxi to take Jessica to the hospital. That was all I could focus on and I was burning with a rage I vowed never to quench. Mark and his mother had no idea I could take such bold action. I cursed them in my heart for disregarding our family like this. Two and a half hours later, my phone was buzzing persistently with calls from Mark. I didn't want to answer, but ignoring it wouldn't change anything. So, with a heavy sigh, I answered the phone. Before I could speak, Mark screamed in a voice close to a shriek. Help me! It turned out they had a single car accident on the way to the airport. My car is a manual transmission. Mark had practiced driving it, but I guess he forgot how since he commutes by train. But he couldn't admit he wasn't confident driving an MT car in front of Sandra. Of course, the insurance was set up properly, covering the spouse for driving so him driving wasn't illegal or anything. Since Mark took the car despite my objections, the accident was his own fault. While I was thinking this, Mark blurted out. 
We got delayed by the accident handling, and now we're running out of time for our flight. It's your car, so you deal with it. It's all because of this hard-to-drive car. It wastes so much gas, and what's so good about this old car anyway? His complaints sounded like the howling of a defeated dog. Having reached a point of indifference, I replied with a smirk. So what? You knew my car was a MT, right? You took it by force. The responsibility for an accident lies with the driver, not the owner. You hit a guardrail, right? Then you'll pay for the car's repairs with your own money. And, of course, for the damage to the guardrail. With that, I hung up. The phone kept ringing persistently, but I was in the hospital. Jessica's condition was different from the epidemic, requiring further tests, which we were waiting for. I had no room to deal with such selfish people. Ignoring the calls, I then heard the notification sound for an email. Seeing that I wasn't answering the phone and had switched to messaging, I checked my mobile phone and my brows furrowed at the sender's name. I thought Mark's parents had joined forces with him, but while Sandra was desperately asking for help, Daniel's message was inquiring what had happened. Replying only to Daniel revealed a shocking truth. Daniel said, I hadn't even heard about any trip to Hawaii, I was enjoying my time with my gateball friends today. Then Sandra had called him, saying, We had an accident, come pick us up. But she wouldn't elaborate, only saying, Just come. Thinking it was just a prank for attention, Daniel was surprised to receive a call from Mark asking for help too. Assuming that I and his granddaughter Jessica were involved, he sent a worried email. Why didn't you reply to the two of them and only messaged me? When I called Daniel to ask this, his response was unexpected. Of course. We've been separated recently, remembering recent events makes me not want to deal with her. Did my wife cause any trouble? Daniel was unaware that she had moved into our house and thought of her antics as mere trouble. I swallowed hard and slowly explained the situation. Sandra is living in our house now. Today, she left with the family, including Daniel, claiming they were going on a peaceful family trip to Hawaii. After explaining the treatment me and Jessica received just before their departure, Daniel fell silent. After a pause, Daniel finally spoke in a voice lower than I'd ever heard. What is that? Unforgivable. Feeling a chill down my spine from his tone. It was 30 minutes later when the doctor finally called to inform me about Jessica's condition. It seems Jessica had acute gastroenteritis. Being told she needed to be hospitalized, I sighed with relief but also felt a strong sense of guilt for the stress I had caused her. A private room was available, so we were allowed to use it. Jessica, how are you feeling? We got a private room, so rest up. Trying to be as cheerful as possible, Jessica looked remorseful and apologized. I'm sorry. It's my fault mom had to go through this. I'll fall behind in my studies because I'm hospitalized. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I rushed to her side and hugged her gently. I'm not raising you because you're good at studying but because you're my precious child. Just be yourself, Jessica. Then, after Daniel arrived at the hospital, Jessica, who has always adored her grandpa, was delighted. Daniel also seemed happy chatting away with Jessica about a painting contest she had won and how he bragged about her to his gateball friends. That's when the peaceful time was interrupted by a call from Mark and Sandra. You didn't help us and we missed our flight. The whole trip is wasted and we can't get a refund. You owe us for three people's travel expenses. Sandra joined in. It was a chance to reconcile with Daniel. She wailed. I was talking outside the hospital, 
but their voices were so loud that it sounded like they were on speakerphone. Then, Daniel, who had followed me, said, I wasn't invited to any trip to Hawaii. It seems there's another person involved, but it's not Jessica, Linda, or me. Who could it be? Neither of them expected Daniel to be present. They started to panic. Hey, why is dad with Linda? His voice over the phone sounded faint, as if he had gone pale. Daniel knew they were lying and had specifically contacted me to point this out. Then Sandra began making excuses. It was a lie that we invited Daniel. This trip was just for the two of us. So stop prying further. It was as if she was begging to be suspected. I couldn't help but suppress a laugh as I retorted to Sandra's blatant lie. No, what are you talking about? I just checked the reservation site, and it clearly says three people. This left them speechless. And suddenly silent. Recently, Jessica told me Sandra had been fiddling with my computer while I was away. She didn't know the details, but mentioned Hawaii searches. So, I logged into my travel booking site without much hope. And found the reservation for three, made by Sandra under my name. The payment had already been made with my credit card, as confirmed by the statement. I was the one who suffered financial damage. Yet Mark was complaining about cancellation fees. I also found evidence of the reservation for three, prompting me to ask who the third person was. Still, Mark continued to deny. Mom must have made a mistake with the number of people. It was really supposed to be for two. Ah, uh, I see. My response seemed to reassure him, who then sighed with relief. So the trip is cancelled, right? Then come to the location I'm about to tell you. We'll discuss what happens next there. With that, I hung up. After speaking to Jessica, we left the hospital and waited at a nearby family restaurant for Daniel and the two to arrive. Soon after they appeared, Mark inexplicably became angry. The guardrail damage isn't covered by compulsory insurance, so you should handle it with your insurance. Astonished by his audacity, I snapped back. What? You hit it. It's your fault for being careless, so you should pay for it. What nonsense are you talking about? Glaring fiercely, Mark cringed and stepped back. Then Sandra spoke up. That doesn't matter. So, Linda, what's this talk about? Eager to get to the main point, I was somewhat thankful for Sandra's interjection and confirmed. By the way, the dash cam shows that besides mom in the passenger seat and Mark in the driver's seat, there was an unknown young woman sitting in the back. The moment I said this, their faces contorted. My car's dash cam is quite advanced, allowing me to check live footage via a mobile app. Of course, I can also review past footage directly on my phone. My car is quite old and valuable, so I've taken substantial security measures in case of theft. Never did I imagine that it would also serve to uncover Mark's affair. So, you lied about going with Sandra and Daniel, planning to bring your mistress instead. Thank you for leaving such clear evidence. Contrary to my smile, their faces turned increasingly pale. They probably thought they could erase the evidence by removing the SD card. I revealed that I had been suspicious of Mark's behavior from the day I doubted his fidelity and had been looking for evidence of his affair. I had planned to confront him with a divorce once I had solid evidence, which was when Sandra started her stay. Then they left for Hawaii, and Jessica came down with a high fever. I was too busy to act, but I had been considering divorcing Mark from the start. Silent, unable to respond, Daniel, who had been quiet, suddenly spoke up. Like parent, like child. Sandra, you're silent because you're also having an affair with a younger man, aren't you? Mark, unaware of this, looked at her in surprise. 
In front of everyone at the family restaurant, Sandra's face turned red as her affair was exposed. Being seduced by a much younger man at your age and squandering money on him, and you think you're in love? Talk in your sleep. Daniel, usually quiet, showed his deep anger. It seemed the reason she left home was related to this, ultimately her own fault. Yet she had the nerve to blame Daniel and shamelessly move into my house. I looked at Sandra with disdain. I have no interest in meddling in your affairs. But Mark, you will definitely be divorcing me, and naturally, I will have custody. Child support and compensation are given. Plus, you'll be paying for the car repairs from the accident and the Hawaii trip expenses. And, of course, to her as well. At that moment, Mark began apologizing profusely, not caring who was watching. Got it, got it. I'll pay for everything. I'll pay the compensation to her too. Just don't contact her, please. The reason I heard was astonishing. Mark's mistress appears to be the daughter of an important client at his company, and she was unaware that Mark was married. Sandra liked that the mistress came from a wealthy family and had been trying to deepen their relationship by suggesting, let's go on a trip together. The naive girl took her seriously and was flattering Mark for driving an old manual car. This was confirmed through the dash cam footage. Flattered by the praise, he crashed into a guardrail due to not paying attention to the road ahead. Daniel and I exchanged looks and chuckled at the absurd cause of the accident. They seemed to have parted ways with the mistress by telling her to just go home for now. And then reached out to me. If it gets out that I was dating the president's daughter under false pretenses, I'm definitely getting fired. Please! I'll do whatever you say. Just don't tell her about it. Come on, we're husband and wife, shouldn't you at least show some consideration in the end? I was a good husband who supported you, I think I deserve that much. Laughing at his attitude, I responded. All right. I'll listen to everything you have to say, so don't come back later with I'm sorry, please help me or any pathetic requests, okay? As if I'd beg like that. All right, it's settled then. Thus, it was decided that Mark and I would divorce, and I would demand a certain amount for child support, thus ending our marriage. But the real drama began afterward. What do you mean? She found out about the affair. Some time after the divorce, Mark called me in agony. I realized I had forgotten to block his number as he continued to complain. This is the worst. The president insists on apologizing to you, and he's furious at me. You broke the promise not to tell her, so give me back the money now. As I listened to Mark's rant, I wondered why I ever married such a person. Then, I decided to reveal a truth he hadn't anticipated. You know I'm a car enthusiast, right? And the president you mentioned runs an auto parts manufacturing company. I've been a regular customer there. I had your accident car repaired there. By chance, your mistress saw the car, screamed, and everything was exposed. See? I didn't break any promise. Is that so? Realizing this, Mark groaned. His mistress was a hard-working apprentice mechanic at her father's company. It was natural for her to be shocked when a woman unknown to her brought in the car her boyfriend had damaged for repairs. When asked, I simply stated the truth. My husband, well, ex-husband, crashed the car into a guardrail. The car is registered in my name, so I brought it in for repairs. The mistress guessed the rest, explained the situation to her father, and from there, the story reached his company. Her father was furious, saying, what kind of upbringing allows a man to target my daughter while he has a wife? Am I going to lose everything? Kicked out of my home, no money, estranged by my dad, and only my troublesome mom left, now I'm losing my job too. But it was all his own doing. 
If you had lived decently, this wouldn't have happened. Your actions are to blame. Take care, and don't ever contact me again. I made my point clear and hung up. Ensuring to block his number this time, severing all ties with him for good. After some time, I received notification that my car had been repaired, and reluctantly, I learned about his current situation. Apparently, he was indeed fired from his company. Not just for misconduct, but also because it was discovered he had been embezzling company funds. Though offered the option to return the money for a mere demotion, Mark, burdened by a significant debt after paying me, had no such luxury. Thus, he left the company unceremoniously. Sandra remained wholly dependent on Mark. Given her age in the 60s, it wasn't feasible to force her to work, and with no money, they had no choice but to take care of each other at home. Now, they are cramped together in a cheap studio apartment. Naturally, Sandra and Daniel divorced, agreeing to Daniel's condition of no alimony in exchange for not pursuing compensation. However, this left them in severe poverty. Despite trying to save every day, Mark couldn't resist when Sandra ordered expensive delivery food, leading to a dispute that involved the police. Eventually, Sandra started working, taking a part-time job at a convenience store a few days a week. It's pitiful she has to work at her age, but in Sandra's case, it was a clear case of reaping what she sowed, garnering no sympathy. Though I've divorced Mark, my daily life continues as usual. I had been the primary breadwinner, and Jessica and I continued living in our home, so there was no change in our living environment. Interestingly, Jessica's grades improved slightly after being freed from his nagging, especially as she entered middle school, where her art grades were exceptional, expressing a desire to pursue an artistic career. As a parent, I simply respect my child's choices, no matter how challenging the path. There's no harm in letting her pursue her interests to her heart's content. Look! I won first place in the contest again! That's amazing! Jessica, you truly have a talent for art! I report our current situation like this during visits to Daniel, now in a facility. Though no longer my father-in-law post-divorce, we've continued interacting through Jessica. I'm endlessly grateful to Daniel for believing in me over his wife or son. I hope he lives a long and fulfilling life. Pain ran down my left cheek along with a banging sound. I couldn't quite grasp what was happening. Why did a stranger woman just slap me? It's because your husband got me pregnant. She declared with a triumphant look on her face, which only added to my confusion. For 28 years of my life, I had always been single. A few days later, an unexpected truth comes to light. I'm Kelly, 28 years old. I work for an IT company and live alone. Far from being married, I don't even have a boyfriend. Lately, my parents press, quick, I want to see my grandchildren. But I'm troubled with it. Right now, I find my job really fulfilling. Therefore, I don't feel any rush to get married, and I believe that as long as I'm leading a fulfilling life, that's what matters most. However, recently, apart from the excessive expectations of my parents, I have another concern, or rather, a troubling situation. It feels like I'm being followed by someone. It might sound exaggerated to call it stalking, but every few days, I feel someone watching me intently. It started two months ago. After work, I took the bus to my nearest station. As I walked from the station to my house, I constantly felt someone's presence behind me. I felt a strong gaze and turned around, but no one was there. Yet, the sound of footsteps continued from behind, and no matter when I turned, I couldn't catch sight of anyone. That day, I convinced myself it was just my imagination and forcibly shrugged it off. But the same situation continued three or four days a week, and I couldn't help but feel it wasn't just my imagination. Who could be following me? And for what purpose? I haven't had any conflicts in my personal relationships. I even tried to recall if I had gotten into any trouble, but nothing came to mind. In fact, aside from work, 
I hardly interacted with people, so that situation was baffling. Before I knew it, I was feeling more and more afraid every day. My concentration at work even began to decline because of that. Then one day, my colleague Rala, who I usually got along with, approached me. Hey Kelly, you've been looking down lately, are you okay? Are you feeling unwell? No, it's not that, just, you know. You were doing so well at work, but lately, you've been making mistakes, right? Even yesterday, you were pointed out by our boss. I know. My concentration has been a bit. What's wrong? It's not like you to be this down. I'm worried. She looked at me with genuine concern. Feeling too burdened to keep it to myself any longer, I decided to confide in her. Actually, I've been feeling like someone's been following me recently. What? You mean like a stalker? Well, calling it stalking might be a bit much. But yeah, a few days a week, from the bus station to my house, I feel like I'm being followed. That's scary! Isn't that dangerous? Knowing where you live and all, you should talk to the police. But isn't that a bit overreacting? Better to do something now than regret it later. You should deal with it as soon as possible. Rala. To think she'd take my seemingly hopeless story so seriously. Maybe I was being naive, but should I really talk to the police? Her earnest expression made it clear she was genuinely concerned about me. After being persuaded repeatedly by her, I decided to visit the police on my way home that day. A few hours later, at the police station on my way from the station to my house, I confided my recent unease to the police. Lately, I feel like someone's been following me. I've never actually seen them though. You've never seen them? Then how do you know you're being followed? From the bus station to my house, I can definitely feel someone trailing me. But whenever I turn around, there's no one there. Well, without knowing the person's description, there's not much we can do. I know, but I really feel someone's presence. If anything else happens, please come back. We can help more if you see who it is. Yes, please. I was practically sent home against my will. Frustration and anger at the police for not being able to do anything swirled inside me. Although about two months had passed since then, the situation was still the same. I still felt followed several days a week on my way home from the station. I'd never caught a glimpse of the person, but there was one thing I'd noticed newly. The person following me was a woman. Until then, I hadn't paid much attention to the sound of footsteps, probably just regular sneakers. Yet, a few days before, I had heard the sound of heels. And that day, again, I heard the sound of heels behind me. As usual, I turned around, no one was there. But someone was definitely following me. The fact that wearing heels meant it was a woman. So, I tried to think again if there was any issue in my social circle. No matter how much I thought, nothing came to mind. Work was going smoothly, and I was not having conflicts with other employees. I didn't have a romantic partner, so there was no chance of being entangled in love troubles. I had not done anything that would warrant resentment. Could it be a woman who cares about me? No, that's unlikely for someone like me. So for what? There's no reason for someone to follow me. With these uneasy thoughts, time just kept passing. About a month later, I finally came face to face with her. As usual, I was walking from the station, and sure enough, I heard the sound of heels behind me. Again, I thought, I quickened my pace. Then I heard a dull sound from behind. What was that sound? I instinctively turned around and saw a woman lying on the ground. It seemed she stumbled over a curb and fell. She grimaced as she slowly got up. I immediately rushed over to her, the woman who was presumably my stalker, and spoke to her. Your knee is bleeding, are you okay? Um, you're the one who's been following me, right? Do you need something from me? Firstly, who are you? Just as I was about to say that, she stood up. Without saying anything, she ran back the way she came. What's going on? She's been following me, but ignores me when I talk to her. If she had something to say, she should just say it. The woman, who appeared to be a few years younger than me, was undoubtedly the person who had been following me. But I didn't recognize her face, nor did I know her name. All I could tell was that she was a petite, younger woman. 
Why was she following me? Why wouldn't she answer when I asked her what she wanted? Who on earth was she? The reality was far from what I had imagined, leaving me somewhat deflated. The fear I had felt until then had almost vanished, leaving only questions. A few days later, as the identity of my stalker became clearer, my wariness faded. Knowing the stalker was a petite woman somehow made me feel less threatened. That day, I was aware of footsteps behind me as usual, but I didn't think much of it and continued on my way home. However, I felt the footsteps quicken, unlike usual. What? They seem faster than before. Am I going to be caught up? A trickle of sweat ran down my back. Before I knew it, I was walking faster, but her pace didn't slow down. If I sped up, the steps would quicken in response. I was sure it would catch up if that continued. So, I decided to stop abruptly. Confirming that the footsteps also stopped, I turned around forcefully. There was no one there. But on closer inspection, I could see white heels peeking out from behind a pole. I slowly approached and saw the same woman, who had silently left before. I stood in front of her, legs slightly apart, and looked straight into her eyes as I confronted her. What's your purpose? Following me around like this every day? Silent again? You wouldn't be following me for no reason, right? Enough already! What do you want? If you keep ignoring me, I'll take you straight to the police. It was then, as I said so forcefully, that I felt a sharp pain on my left cheek. I couldn't comprehend what was happening. What? Did I just get slapped? The pain in my slapped cheek intensified. Holding my cheek, I muttered, that hurts. And then I heard a scoff. When I instinctively looked up, there she was, smirking maliciously. With that unpleasant smile, she said, because your husband got me pregnant. What? What did you just say? Didn't you hear? I said I'm pregnant with your husband's child. My husband's child. Did you just say that? Yeah. How does it feel to have your husband taken by me? Confusion clouded my mind. I didn't have a husband. First of all, I was not even married. Trying to clear the misunderstanding, I blurted out. No, wait. You must be mistaken. But as soon as I said that, a dull pain struck my right cheek. Of course, it was her. She had slapped my cheek with the opposite hand that time. That moment, the anger I had been holding back exploded. I had tried to keep things calm, assuming she was a stranger, but then I had reached my limit. I glared at her and said firmly, What are you doing? How dare you slap someone out of the blue? What kind of person are you? Oh, scary. Are you that upset because a young and pretty lady stole your husband? Stop talking nonsense. I told you, you've got the wrong person. Stop joking. Anyway, can you just get a divorce? There's a baby from your husband in my belly, you know. Ignoring my words entirely, she kept pushing her narrative. My irritation peaked, and I stated the plain truth. I'm not married, you know. Huh? At my statement, her expression froze. Seizing the moment of her confusion, I pressed on relentlessly. Did you hear? I said I'm not married. I don't even have a boyfriend, actually. Hold on. What are you talking about? That's my line. You're talking about your husband's child, but I don't have a husband. I'm not even married. Don't tell me you're pretending not to know. Just so you know, I won't be fooled. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't care whose child you're carrying, but it has nothing to do with me. Got it? Now go back home. With that, I left her behind and continued on my way home. I could hear her screams from behind, but I ignored them and headed to my house. What was that all about? Husband and child. Who is she mistaking me for? I'm exhausted from all this. Once home, I lay on the sofa for a while, but the fatigue didn't fade. Feeling too tired to cook, I decided to go to the grocery store nearby. After shopping at the store about a five-minute walk from the house, I stepped outside. Suddenly, large raindrops began to fall. Oh no. What should I do? I didn't bring an umbrella. While sheltering from the rain at the store, someone tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around to find a familiar-looking man. Uh, I think you're. 
I'm Tommy. We live in the neighbor. This kind of thing has happened before, right? I'm Kelly. Thanks for last time. My pleasure. I can walk you to the house today too, if you like. Thank you, that would be great. No problem, come on under the umbrella. The man who offered me shelter under his umbrella was Tommy, a resident of the same area. I knew of him because we often saw each other at the bus station on weekday mornings, but I didn't know his name. A few months ago from that day, I had also been caught in the rain while shopping at the grocery store. He had happened to be there and offered to share his umbrella. I remembered having walked back to the house with him under one umbrella. For that day, once again, I found myself under his care. As we chatted about trivial things on our way to the house, suddenly from behind, a shouting voice rang out. Hey! I turned around instinctively, and there was the stalker woman. She approached and grabbed my collar. This awful woman. So you are Tommy's woman after all. Last time and this time too. Sharing an umbrella together, unforgivable. Let go. Tommy is just a neighborhood. Don't play dumb. Tommy is going to marry me. You better disappear fast. Get a divorce. She gripped my collar, shook me violently, and then pushed me away forcefully. I stumbled and fell hard. Tommy rushed to me and asked, Are you okay? As I nodded, the stalker woman shouted at him, her face red with rage. Tommy! Why are you caring about this woman? I'm serious about you. Stop it. To begin with, I don't even like you. No. I won't give up. Break up with her quickly. She's not my woman. She just lives in the same area. Huh? You've just been misunderstanding and resenting her for nothing. I'm not even married. I just lied about being married because you kept stalking me. That can't be true, can it? As she kneels in confusion, Tommy stares at her sternly. Looking down at her in the rain, he says coldly, I only picked up your wallet once and took you to dinner as a thank you. But you've been persistently following me ever since. To be clear, you're a nuisance. Please, stop involving yourself with me. Wait, Tommy. The atmosphere was so nice during dinner. That's just what you think. I never felt that way. You keep contacting me despite my ignoring you. If I'm ignoring you, take the hint. I will never like you. If you show up in front of me again, I'll take you to the police. After his blunt statement, the woman slowly stood up. Staggering, she turned on her heel and left. Since then, she never appeared in front of me again. I later learned from Tommy that he had only dined with her once and there was no romantic relationship. She probably mistook me for his wife and fabricated lies to break us up. I was merely caught in the middle, an utterly bothersome situation. Afterward, I got the woman's name and contact information from Tommy and consulted a lawyer. Even though it was a misunderstanding, I decided to claim damages for being suddenly slapped. A few weeks later, Tommy said, I want to apologize for what happened. And we went out for a meal. That led to us regularly going out together, and recently, he asked me out. It was a terrible start, but in a way, I have her to thank for bringing me closer to him. Though the beginning was the worst, I'm grateful to her for leading me to meet him. Kelly, I'm really sorry about that time. I dragged you into my problem. It's okay. I don't mind anymore. Besides, I'm happy now. If anything comes up, feel free to talk to me. I'm truly your boyfriend now. Thank you. I'll count on you if anything happens. There might be more people like her in the future. But I'm sure he'll protect me. And one day, I hope to build a happy family with him. I can't trust you to take care of mom anymore. Standing next to Georgie, who said this with a stern expression, Sophia is nodding over and over with a smug smile. I, too, think it's better if we live with Georgie and his wife. So, I want you to move out as soon as possible. Hearing those words, I felt my heart go cold. Anger bubbled up within me towards Sophia, who had always ordered me around, 
and towards Georgie and his wife, who had never lifted a finger to help. Seeing me like this, Georgie looked down on me with displeasure. What's with that look? A disgrace who can't even properly care for mom acting all high and mighty. My name is Olivia. I'm 32 years old and work for a major IT company. I live at my parents' house with my father, Kevin, and my mother, Sophia, both 62 years old. I have a very good relationship with Kevin, who has a solid personality. He introduced me to fishing, a hobby of ours, and we often go fishing together on weekends. On the other hand, Sophia has a free-spirited nature. Whenever I planned to relax at home on weekends, she would suddenly barge into my room saying, We're going on a trip right now. Get ready immediately. Without listening to my opinion, she'd take me on trips on a whim, which happened quite frequently. My family also includes my older brother, Georgie, who is three years my senior. Like Sophia, Georgie acts before thinking so his personality clashes with my cautious nature. We fought constantly as children, resulting in a strained sibling relationship. When Georgie and I would fight, Sophia often intervened to mediate, but she has always favored Georgie, telling me I was in the wrong and that I should apologize to him. Now that we're adults, we've stopped fighting, but looking back, it feels like Sophia always preferred Georgie. Georgie ended up marrying Cindy, a colleague from his work, five years ago after she became pregnant. This led him to move out of the house. There had been talk of living together, but Cindy refused, so that idea fell through, leaving Kevin, Sophia, and me to live as a trio. For years ago, Kevin died in a truck accident while at work. The sudden loss left me emotionally unstable, unable to cope, and it took me a long time to recover. But the shock of losing Kevin was even more profound for Sophia than it was for me. Sophia, who had been a housewife, stopped doing any household chores and secluded herself in her room after the accident. Then, misfortune continued when Sophia misstepped on the house's stairs, tumbling down and suffering severe injuries. Thankfully, it wasn't life-threatening, but she became physically dependent on care. Sophia, further disheartened by her injuries, not only secluded herself in her room but also stopped eating the meals I prepared. When I saw her after a long time, she had become emaciated. Thus, believing this situation wasn't good for Sophia, I resolved to use Kevin's inheritance and my savings to build a barrier-free house that would make living easier for Sophia. The construction proceeded smoothly and, while not a mansion, a functional, barrier-free house suitable for caring for Sophia was completed. Sophia seemed to like it very much and gradually began to regain her usual cheerfulness. Moreover, she couldn't walk around freely, but she started coming out of her room, sitting on the porch to relax. Since then, I've been living busy days, juggling work, household chores, and caring for Sophia. One day after work, I came home to find Georgie and his wife visiting with their child. And the laughter of Sophia and Georgie filled the entrance. I'm home. Oh, big brother, you're here. Welcome. As I greeted them, Georgie, seeing me just home, said he wanted to talk. After changing from my suit into casual clothes, I headed to the living room where Georgie and the others were waiting. What's all this formality about? What's going on? I asked, and Georgie cheerfully responded. We were just discussing, and we've decided to live with mom. So, Olivia, you need to leave this house. Despite refusing to live together when they got married, this sudden change of policy. And the declaration of living with Sophia, along with the unreasonable demand for me to leave, left me unable to comprehend. This house isn't built for two families. With the child and all, we won't have enough rooms. So, Olivia, you need to leave. Besides, you're 32, right? 
It's not good to keep relying on your parents and living at home forever. That's right, Olivia. How can you not see that you're being a burden to Sophia? As an adult, you should have realized this without us having to say anything. It's time to stop depending on your parents and become independent. While I was being unilaterally criticized by Georgie and Cindy, I wanted to argue that I wasn't actually depending on my parents. To be honest, I've always wanted to live with Georgie and the rest. He's our precious eldest son, after all. And Olivia, you've always been so cautious and slow, it's been frustrating to watch. Plus, I could never tell what you were thinking, which was creepy. Sophia suddenly came out with her desire to live with Georgie and their family and revealed what she really thought of me. Besides, even now, Olivia, you hardly do any housework because you're always busy with work. There's no point in living with Olivia, who is useless. Now that Georgie and his family have said they'll live with me, you should quickly pack your things and leave. Sophia saw me not as a family member, but merely as a convenient housekeeper. Due to my work commitments and coming home late during busy periods, I couldn't adequately keep up with household chores, prompting the suggestion that I leave. I could forgive the harsh words from Georgie and Cindy, but Sophia's words deeply wounded me. Since Kevin passed away, I've struggled to support Sophia, pushing through my fatigue after work to take care of the household and provide care for Sophia. Moreover, Georgie and his wife were living far from the house, so I couldn't rely on them for support. Additionally, my workplace is a bit far from home, requiring a considerable commute time. My job does not accommodate remote work, so I commute daily by train. I had thought many times about moving closer to my company after Kevin died. Yet, despite Sophia's profound grief over losing Kevin and her need for care, I chose to support her. But to her, it seems I was just a housekeeper. Feeling betrayed by Sophia, sadness and anger began to swell within me. Busy with work and can't even take proper care of mom, huh? Really, you're such a disgrace. You're failing as a family member. Stop half-assing it and just pack your bags and leave if you're that incompetent. Hey, Georgie, don't you think calling her a failure as a family member is too much? Don't worry, Olivia. We'll live together and take perfect care of Sophia, just you watch. Oh, Cindy, that's so reassuring. Unlike Olivia, you make me feel secure. This is how a family should be. These words from Georgie and the others unleashed the pent-up anger and sadness within me. Understood. I'll get everything sorted and leave you to your freedom. Suppressing various emotions, I said just that and returned to my room. As I ascended the stairs to my room, the voices of Sophia and the others, gossiping about me, could still be heard from the living room. It seemed I was the only one who thought of us as a family, it appeared the others did not consider me part of theirs. Realizing this, the suppressed feelings of anger, sadness, and frustration came flooding back. After entering my room and closing the door, I decided to make a significant phone call, harboring strong emotions. Two weeks after I left the house, I received a call from Georgie. Hey! Mom isn't doing any household chores at all. What's going on? According to Georgie, Sophia wasn't taking care of the house or the children at all, leaving them in a bind. I had assumed this would be the case since Sophia hadn't been doing chores even when I was living there, but it seems Cindy had different expectations. It turns out Cindy had hoped that, despite needing some care, Sophia's condition wasn't serious and that she could handle household chores and look after the grandchildren, allowing Cindy to take it easy. I couldn't help but feel astounded by Cindy's overly optimistic thinking and Georgie's complaints despite agreeing to it so readily. There was no way living together and relying on mom from the start was going to work. 
Plus, we knew she needed care all along. What are you complaining about now? I wasn't told she couldn't move around this much. Georgie came up with excuses like a child. And that's not all. People claiming to be from a real estate and construction company have been showing up, asking to see the house, causing us trouble. They're probably scammers, so we've been ignoring them. But they've been sending letters for a while, showing up at the house, and even calling. It's getting really annoying. Georgie said this in frustration, and I calmly replied. Oh, that's because I hired a professional service. I've sold the house, so you'll need to move out soon. What? Why are you selling mom's house without permission? It's our house, don't mess around. I ignored Georgie's yelling and explained that Sophia was already informed. Why do you think the house I paid to build is mom's, let alone yours? I built it, so it's my right to sell it. The buyer wants to demolish it and the surrounding land to build condominiums. They were thrilled to buy it. Why would you do something like that on your own? We're living there right now. Is this how you treat family? Who was it that said to leave because I was useless? Besides, it's my house that I bought, so I can do whatever I want with it. As I countered Georgie, who tended to ignore inconvenient truths, he seemed to run out of arguments. Georgie suddenly changed his tone, pleading with me in a different voice. Please! We were wrong! So, stop selling the house and cancel the demolition. Talk to the company and convince them to stop. I'll even let you live here. We'll make the rent cheap and even do some of the housework. How about that? It's not a bad deal, right? I'm saying we'll welcome you back into the family. Even in this situation, Georgie seemed not to understand his position at all. Despite it being the house I bought, he's talking about charging me rent, assuming I'd do the housework, and saying they'd welcome me back into the family. I was utterly astounded by Georgie's arrogant remarks, informed him that a buyer had already been found and that the sale wouldn't be reversed, and he should leave the house without causing any more trouble for the company, then hung up. Georgie called again shortly after, but I blocked his number. Soon after, I received messages from both Cindy and Sophia, blaming me and asking to stop the sale of the house, but I replied with rejections to both and decided to block Sophia and Georgie's contacts, resolved never to see them again. A colleague who lives near the house I had built later told me about Sophia and Georgie's situation. After our call, the contractors moved in quickly to start demolishing the house. Sophia and the Georgies resisted until the end, trying to prevent the contractors from entering and spreading malicious rumors about illegal construction in the neighborhood, continuing their harassment and interference. I had warned the contractors in advance that these people were difficult and might cause trouble, so they were somewhat prepared. However, overwhelmed by the severity of their malicious harassment, the contractors reached their limit and threatened to call the police if the harassment and interference continued. Faced with cold stares from those looking forward to the new condominium and the mention of the police, Sophia and Georgie stopped their resistance and ceased their harassment. Demolition progressed smoothly after that, and Sophia and Georgie, having lost their house, hastily rented a small apartment nearby. However, Sophia continued not to do any housework or care for the children, and Cindy had to take on both household chores and care. Frustrations in living with Sophia accumulated, leading to daily arguments loud enough for the neighbors to hear. When Cindy could no longer bear it and sought Georgie's advice, he kept avoiding the issue, too busy with work to listen properly. Eventually, Cindy reached her limit and, one night while everyone was asleep, took the children and left Sophia and Georgie's place for good. Georgie frantically tried to contact Cindy but couldn't reach her, 
finding only a completed divorce application left behind. The apartment they hastily moved into was chosen in a rush, prioritizing speed without properly checking the interior or specifying detailed conditions. As a result, the living situation became difficult for Sophia, who needed care. After Cindy left, Sophia reluctantly began to do household chores but couldn't manage everything due to her injuries. Georgie also started doing household chores out of necessity, but having never done them before, the quality was terrible, leading to daily arguments with Sophia. Georgie, having been left by his wife and children and returning home tired from work, faced the stress of unfamiliar chores in caring for Sophia appearing older than his actual age and becoming isolated at work. Originally, Georgie had an outgoing personality like Sophia's, with many friends and a fulfilling private life, but his mental state deteriorated due to his current lifestyle, leading to harsh behavior. Gradually, he lost friends and was avoided at work, becoming lonely. Moreover, Sophia has been looking for me recently, shouting my name around the house, becoming the talk of the neighborhood, as a colleague mentioned. As for me, I am now living abroad. My boss had always wanted me to go to our overseas branch, but I had declined due to caring for Sophia, who needed assistance. However, after being driven out of the house, I accepted the overseas transfer without hesitation and left for America. Life in a new environment is full of exciting new challenges. And while it requires a different perspective from America, I find it very rewarding. Before leaving America, a colleague who had long harbored feelings for me confessed, and we started dating. Though we are in a long-distance relationship, we found in each other the best partner to encourage and elevate one another. He proposed that we get married when I return to America, so I eagerly await my return, fully committed to my work. Freed from the troubling relationships of the past, I am savoring happiness and living fulfilling days. I want to marry Thomas the doctor, so please divorce him, old woman. One day, a young woman suddenly showed up at our house and said, Elizabeth, a bar girl who is 12 years younger than me, was leaning on my husband Thomas's arm as if seeking his affection. Sure, but there's one condition. I said with a smile, looking at both of them. I'll file for divorce right in front of you. So, will you apply for your marriage certificate in front of me? The two, momentarily confused by what was said, accepted with a smug smile. Trying not to burst into laughter, I headed to the family court with them to submit the divorce application. My name is Amelia. I'm 34 years old and work as an internist at a hospital. My husband Thomas, who is the same age, also works at the same hospital. Since we both have night shifts, our days off rarely coincide, and we don't have any children yet. While we used to get comments about grandchildren from my parents and parents-in-law, they've pretty much stopped now. Given our busy schedules and the possibility of being called into work unexpectedly, they seem to have accepted that grandchildren are off the table as long as I work at this hospital. Though I feel a bit guilty towards our parents, I find my job very fulfilling. Thomas likes his job too and occasionally attends skill upgrade training sessions. His hard work is well regarded in the hospital, and despite our busy schedules, we lead fulfilling lives. My discontent with Thomas began when the rules we set at the beginning of our marriage started to be ignored. Given our demanding jobs, we had clearly set some rules regarding household chores. One of them was that the person not on night shift would take care of the chores. Since our night shifts are irregular, it's difficult to divide the chores by day or type. Therefore, we decided to base it on the presence or absence of night shifts. Until now, if I was on a night shift, Thomas would cook simple meals and take care of cleaning and laundry. However, lately, even when he's not on night shift, Thomas is often out at night. Hey, have you been leaving the house more often, even on nights you're not working? Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry, 
I've been invited out for drinks a lot lately because the instructor seems to like me. I used to decline, but it felt bad to always say no, and after I accepted once, the invitations just kept coming. Sorry. I'll try to reduce the frequency. Indeed, the hospital is hosting various training sessions at this time. Some of which involve external instructors, I remembered, patting Thomas on the shoulder. It's fine. It means you're just that wanted, right? Plus, the training sessions are only for about two more weeks. Don't worry about the house and just do your best. Sorry, that helps a lot. Thomas is a good listener, which often leads me to share many things with him. It made sense why he was favored by the instructor. Though Thomas said he would use his own allowance for the drinking parties, at that rate, it would quickly run out. So, I decided to cover the expenses for the next two weeks from our living expenses. For the next two weeks, Thomas started going out at night whenever there were training sessions. Even after the training ended, the night outings continued. I thought he was busy with night shifts, but Ms. Brown, a veteran janitor, told me that wasn't the case. Thomas hasn't been doing many night shifts lately. We'd prefer to leave it to the men, especially since we have many older staff in our department. It turned out Thomas was going out at night even when he wasn't on night shift. Just when I was about to confront him, my schedule got so hectic that I didn't have the time to question him. By the time my schedule calmed down, I no longer felt like confronting Thomas. All I wanted was to come home and sleep in my bed. Exhausted, when I returned home after a night shift, there was an unfamiliar woman's umbrella at our house. I'm home. Thomas, do we have a guest? Welcome back. Sorry for the suddenness, but there's something we need to talk about. As I walked into the living room, I saw Thomas sitting on the sofa with an unknown woman next to him. The woman, who looked like a college student, was snuggling up to Thomas. Uh, can I leave my bag here? Yeah, that's fine but I hope you can make it quick. The atmosphere clearly indicated it wasn't a good conversation, so I sighed and went to leave my belongings in the room. Without changing, I returned to the living room in my work clothes and sat on the sofa facing Thomas and the woman. I believe this is our first meeting. What brings you here today? Nice to meet you. I'm Elizabeth. I came here today because I want you to divorce Thomas, old woman. More than being called old woman by someone I just met, it was her lisping speech that irked me. Holding back my confusion, I looked at Thomas, who seemed flustered for a moment but then met my gaze firmly. Elizabeth works at the bar where I went with the instructor. She's a college student working part-time to pay for her tuition, a very earnest girl. A college student? No offense, but how old are you? Are you even over 21? I'm 22. Old woman and I have a 12-year gap. Interesting, isn't it? I wanted to challenge her comment about being interesting but resigned myself to glaring at Thomas. So, you cheat on me while I'm busy and now want to marry a younger girl and ask for a divorce, is that it? Why do you have to say it like it's something bad? I just want to protect Elizabeth for the rest of my life. You can live on your own, but Elizabeth needs me. Thomas, that's so cool. Watching them engage in affectionate gestures before me made me sigh. Thomas was completely smitten by Elizabeth, finding everything she said adorable, which was incredibly annoying. Every time I called Elizabeth's name, she looked at me with a triumphant, smug smile. Do you really want to marry this man? A man who goes to bars while married, brags, and lies. A man who takes the sales talk of bars seriously. Are you sure you won't regret it? Of course I want to marry him. After all, 
Thomas is a doctor and earns a lot. It's terrible to accuse him of lying. He's promised to stop going to bars once we're married. Thomas and I are in love, so it'll be fine. Hearing this, Thomas hugged Elizabeth as if moved, and they once again retreated into their own world. I stared at Thomas in disbelief, but our eyes never met. All right then. If you two have decided on that, I'll divorce you. But there's a condition. What's the condition? Division of assets? At Thomas's words, I shook my head no, and then looked at them with a smile. We're going to the family court together. I want Elizabeth to witness Thomas and I submitting our divorce application. After the divorce application is accepted, I want you two to apply for your marriage certificate in front of me. That's all. The two, initially confused by what was said, stood up delighted when they realized that was the only condition. Then, the three of us headed to the family court. At the family court, Thomas and I first submitted our divorce application. I made a somewhat unreasonable request to the staff to expedite the process as much as possible. Later, when the divorce application was accepted, we went to the state office, where Thomas and Elizabeth applied for their marriage certificate. I helped them fill out the application forms and advised them on the necessary identification documents, all the while curious glances from those around us. The atmosphere of an ex-wife helping the new wife with the paperwork felt awkward, and the staff deliberately avoided looking at us. I felt a bit guilty, but I couldn't help feeling good about myself. Then, I returned home and moved all my belongings to my parents' house. Since I hardly ever shopped due to my demanding job and left the household items behind, there wasn't much to move except for valuables and clothes. I managed to pack everything into suitcases and moved out by car in less than a day. When I got back to my parents' house, they were furious with Thomas, but I calmed them down with a smile. Don't worry. I'm not letting this go. I'll make sure both of them end up in a miserable situation. Three days later, I was called to a meeting room through an internal phone line at the hospital reception. A woman is here insisting on seeing the doctor. What should I do? Please direct her to an available room. I'll come over as soon as I finish my consultation. When I arrived at the designated meeting room, unsurprisingly, it was Elizabeth. She was taken aback upon seeing me in my lab coat. Hello. I've managed to spare five minutes between consultations, so let's make this quick, shall we? What do you mean? He wasn't a doctor, and you are, eh? Elizabeth was panicking, but I didn't have the time to calm her down. I informed Elizabeth with a smile. Indeed, Thomas works at this hospital but he is a janitor. He's responsible for everything from cleaning to disinfection, a valued staff member. What? He lied to me. Elizabeth slammed her fist on the meeting room table, ranting about Thomas. Didn't you listen? I told you, Thomas is a man who brags and lies about his status. Life might be tough from now on, but good luck. This is a joke. If he's not a doctor, I don't need such a man. I waved goodbye to the nearly explosive Elizabeth and left the meeting room. I heard her trying to stop me, but I rushed back to my consultation room with full speed. After exchanging high fives with the nurses who knew the situation, I calmed down and called in the next patient. Later, Elizabeth found Thomas working in the hospital and demanded a divorce. Elizabeth shouted that there was no point in being married if he wasn't a doctor, while Thomas loudly claimed that love doesn't care about professions. The spectacle was witnessed by waiting patients and nurses, quickly becoming the talk of the hospital. Despite whispers from onlookers, the heated argument between the two didn't subside until security had to intervene, nearly leading to police involvement. Elizabeth stormed out of the hospital, and Thomas followed her. 
Elizabeth returned home and caused a neighborhood disturbance by screaming at Thomas to divorce her and claiming the house, along with demanding compensation for being deceived. Around the time our divorce became known in the hospital, I filed for compensation against both of them for the affair. Thomas and Elizabeth came to my parents' house immediately after receiving the letter from the lawyer. What the heck is this about demanding compensation? You didn't set any conditions other than remarrying Elizabeth. Why are you demanding compensation now? They barged into the house without hesitation, ranting in front of my parents. Well, Thomas, you cheated on me while we were married, and you, Elizabeth, knew he was married and still had an affair with him, right? So, of course, I'm going to demand compensation from both of you. Don't be ridiculous. It's not my fault. I won't pay a cent. You're so greedy even though you're a doctor. Your nature is so vile. Their yelling didn't bother me at all. Do you know why I included your remarriage in the divorce conditions? Thomas and Elizabeth looked puzzled. One reason is to make it clear that Thomas was having an affair while married to me. Normally, getting remarried just a few weeks after a divorce screams that the person was the affair partner. Though you didn't need to do that since you made a scene at the hospital and everyone already knows. The other reason is to ensure I could definitely get compensation from you. I thought Elizabeth was a fake name you used at the bar and I had no idea where you worked or who you really were. So, I had you fill out the marriage certificate application and helped you with the process. Thanks to that, I got to see all your identification documents. Oh, and when you get married, you have to change your name and address on your driver's license, you know. While Thomas frowned, Elizabeth's face turned paler. So, I'll leave the rest to the lawyer. You can try to dodge or run, but don't forget I have all your personal information. Elizabeth, who works in a bar, must understand the importance of protecting personal information, as it could easily lead to her being stalked. As I smiled, Elizabeth ran off with heavy footsteps. Thomas, looking dumbfounded but irritated at me, followed after Elizabeth. In the now quiet house, I sighed and soothed my angry parents. Elizabeth has been paying the compensation smoothly. Considering she's a college student, I proposed a modest amount, so she should be able to finish paying within the year. Though she wants to divorce Thomas, he's resisting, and neither of them can afford a lawyer for divorce negotiations. Thus, they're separated but not yet divorced. It was also her fault for believing Thomas was a doctor just because she saw a family name similar to his on the hospital's medical staff list. Even though she's still a college student, working in customer service means she should know better than to blur the lines between customers and employees. Perhaps for her, a wealthy doctor was an ideal marriage candidate, but having an affair with a married man was wrong. Even if Thomas agrees to a divorce in the future, she'll have a divorce record. This incident has likely taught her a lesson that destroying someone's family carelessly can lead to dire consequences for herself. As for Thomas, he disappeared from the hospital without me having to do anything. In fact, Thomas, who had left the hospital to follow Elizabeth after she was expelled that day, was in the middle of his shift. As a result, Ms. Brown, a veteran janitor and Thomas's supervisor, was furious. With her face red with anger, she wrote in large letters on Thomas's work schedule that he was absent without permission due to a romantic entanglement. Thanks to that, even the janitors who were off that day came to know about it. Among the staff, that uproar became a major incident, and the patients spread rumors among themselves. As a result, Thomas was the subject of both true and false accusations and ended up being ostracized by everyone, ignored even in greetings, which seemed to break his spirit. One day, he suddenly resigned on his own. Afterward, he apparently returned to his father-in-law house, where his father-in-law, who was already informed of the situation, 
scolded him severely. There was no apology from Thomas, but I decided not to worry about it anymore since the full amount of compensation I had demanded was deposited by my mother-in-law. In the hospital, I received approaches from male doctors and nurses who heard I was single again, but I declined all of them, thinking I'm okay without marriage for a while. I continue to work as an internist, busy but dedicating time to each of my patients. A life without kids is just miserable. My daughter Laura is both adorable and a genius, William said that with a smirk, and I couldn't help but feel a surge of uncontrollable anger. It was like he'd forgotten all he's done to me, and then he just came up to talk to me with that nonsense. I couldn't help but be furious. However, I remembered the situation I was in and managed to suppress my anger. Trying to appear as cheerful as possible, I decided to reply to him. Even if he gets mad at it, it's nothing compared to what I've endured. I called my daughter, who was a little distance away, and proudly said, Okay, let me also introduce my daughter, Jasmine. I'm probably wearing the kind of smile I imagine. While showing that to him, I hugged Jasmine, who ran up to me. What? He looked at us, his mouth agape in surprise. He probably couldn't accept the reality he had always looked down upon. His mistress Kate, who was grinning just like him until a moment ago, also seemed unable to hide her shock. While looking at them, I started talking to Jasmine. My name is Isabel, and I'm a 51-year-old office worker. I have a daughter, and people are often surprised when I tell them she's 12. I did marry late, but there were reasons for that. I have a history of divorce, and I didn't have children at that time. I met my ex-husband William in an arrangement that was almost like an arranged marriage. A friend of mine worried about me always working and not getting married, and threw a party for me. That's where William took a liking to me, and I received his advances. Even so, I wasn't interested at first and was reluctant to respond to his actions. Yet, as he approached me persistently, I gradually started to return his feelings. Eventually, we started dating and soon got married. After marriage, William was serious about having children. Being in my late 30s, I felt a lot of pressure. I don't know if it was because of that, but we couldn't have a baby for a long time. Gradually, William's attitude turned cold, and he started to look down on me. What, infertile? Were you here? Did you pick up the dry cleaning I asked for? He called me infertile, treating me almost like a slave. It was so frustrating, I struggled to find a solution. I went to the hospital imagining the worst, but there was nothing wrong with me. I was even told that stress might be the cause, which left me feeling hopeless. I tried changing my diet, taking supplements. I tried everything, but still couldn't get pregnant. I suggested William get tested, thinking maybe the problem wasn't with me. Listen, William. I went to the hospital, and they found nothing wrong. So, maybe it's worth considering that the issue might be with you, and you should get tested. As soon as I said that, his face turned red with anger. What? You're saying I'm the problem? It's just that you can't get pregnant, don't suspect me. But there's nothing wrong with me, and I've been under treatment for a long time. If we still can't have a baby, it might be because of you. No way. I'm always fine. The problem is definitely with you, okay? He completely rejected my suggestion, blaming me. At first, I fought back, but it's hard when someone keeps saying you're the one at fault. Gradually, I became exhausted, and one day, his words made it clear that I couldn't do it anymore. What's the point of being a woman if you can't even have a baby? He said it so disdainfully, and I couldn't respond. It wasn't that I agreed with his words. Instead, I was shocked at why I had to be spoken to like that. I worked while managing household chores, and I thought I had devoted myself to him, who was also working. Nevertheless, just because I couldn't have a baby, I never expected to be so thoroughly negated. With no emotional support and losing my motivation, I couldn't bring myself to ask him to get tested again. The thought of hearing the same words again frightened me so much that I couldn't speak up. Sensing that, he started commanding me to do various things. Man, I'm tired. I want a different drink, not the usual beer today. Hey, you can't get pregnant, so you must be free, right? Come home right now. 
laughing smugly, he treated me like a slave. If I showed any sign of arguing back, he'd hurl even more abuse at me. Still, I endured and just kept going day by day. You'd think I'd better divorce him if I'm putting up with all that. However, I married late and thought I wouldn't be able to marry again if I let that go. Also, I was embarrassed about divorcing and couldn't take that step. Time passed without me being able to do anything, and I turned 38. That's when things took a sudden turn. Even then, I was enduring harassment almost every day about infertility while continuing to work. Hey, you should know what I don't like by now. I can't eat such terrible food. This is why infertile women. That day, after he snapped at me like that, I couldn't hold back anymore and argued back. What does the meal have to do with not having a baby? I can't stand it anymore. Enough is enough. When I said so, William jumped up and started yelling at me. What's with that attitude? You can't even fulfill your role as a woman, and now you complain to me when I come back from work. Suddenly bombarded with nonsensical complaints, I got furious. What do you mean by a woman's role? If it's about having a baby, you have a responsibility too. I got tested and there was nothing wrong. But you refused to get tested, trying to escape your responsibility. And yet, you only complain about me, which I think is unfair. He seemed a bit taken aback by my rare rebuttal. But his silence was brief, and he soon started hurling abuses again. Why are you so stubborn? In times like these, she would immediately reflect and apologize. Hearing his words, it was my turn to be stunned. Before I could ask who he was talking about, he made a sheepish look and quickly looked away. Then, he left the house without a word. He didn't come home that day, and my distrust in him grew. From his words, it was clear there was another woman. That meant he was cheating, and if I pursued it, I might be able to divorce him. It wouldn't be because I couldn't have children but because of William's affair. Thinking that, I soon took action. I searched online for a nearby private detective agency and hired them. William was apparently cheating recently. I had them investigate his mistress and his behavior. A few weeks after my request, the results came from the agency. During that time, William would come home but wouldn't meet my eyes. He seemed to be avoiding me, and the constant verbal abuse had stopped. Surprised at how comfortably I was living, I regretted not taking action sooner. I should have done this earlier. While thinking that, I looked at the report. It contained the fact that William was having an affair with evidence. It also included a report on his mistress. Her name was Kate. She was 23 years old, naturally younger than both of us. It seemed they started dating soon after I first suggested William get tested. So, he had been cheating for a few years. Angered by the fact, I decided to divorce him and started preparations. While I was preparing, he stayed quiet. That allowed me to steadily proceed, and I finally confronted him about the divorce. William, there's something I need to talk about. It's not about the test, it's more important. When I said that, he looked annoyed as he was just back from work. What now at this time? I've got something to tell you, too. Make it quick. Saying so wearily, he still seemed to be listening while operating his mobile phone. Before he changed his mind, I quickly presented him with the report from the private detective agency. You're having an affair. I've had it properly investigated, so there's no escaping it. With both the baby issue and your affair, I can't take it anymore. I want a divorce. Saying that, I also presented a half-filled divorce application as a sign of my resolve. Far from being flustered, he smirked and took the divorce papers from my hand. Ha, huh, you're well prepared. Such perfect timing makes me doubt your predictive abilities. As he said that and operated his mobile phone, the sound of the front door opening echoed. Good evening. Nice to meet you. I'm Kate, the one who's going to marry William next. Entering from the entrance was the person in the photo enclosed in the report. Younger and cuter than she appeared in the photo, Kate greeted me with a grin. I was just about to introduce you today. I never imagined you'd prepare the divorce papers. If you were always this considerate, I might have stayed, but it's too late now. While half laughing, he entered the living room with the divorce papers in hand. 
Stunned by the sudden turn of events, I stood frozen, unable to grasp the situation. After a while, William came out of the living room, having signed the divorce papers. Handing them to me with a smirk, he said, It saved me a lot of trouble. We're no longer a couple, so leave immediately. Kate's pregnant, and I want her to spend her time as stress-free as possible. With Kate and William smirking maliciously, I lost myself. I snatched the divorce papers from his hand and rushed into my room. Then, I grabbed my already packed bags and left the house without a word. Thirteen years later since then, I was visiting a project I had been involved in that had just been completed. I work as a specialist consultant, and this time I was in charge of designing a condominium that was disaster-resistant and supportive of childcare. At that time, after being introduced to Kate by William, I took refuge in a nearby Holiday Inn. I waited for dawn, then submitted the divorce papers to City Hall and moved from hotel to motel. Eventually, I moved into a house and devoted myself to my work. My mood lightened after divorcing William and work went smoothly, with increased business opportunities and networking. Thanks to that, I was appointed as a project leader, which led to this urban development project. Now that the long-term project was finally complete, I felt relieved. There was a small event, and the place was crowded. Suddenly, I heard a familiar, unpleasant voice. Hey, long time no see. Still all alone? I'm here to buy a condo for a family of three. Not that it matters to you. I regretfully turned towards the voice and regretted it. There stood William and Kate. Between them, there was their daughter, who must have been in Kate's womb at that time. A life without kids is just miserable. My daughter is both adorable and a genius. Seeing William's smirking face, uncontrollable anger surged within me. It was like he forgot all he'd done, casually speaking to me like that. I couldn't help but be furious. As remembering my situation, I managed to suppress my anger. Trying to appear as cheerful as possible, I decided to reply to him. Even if he gets angry, it's nothing compared to what I've endured. I called my daughter, who was a little distance away, and said proudly, Okay, let me also introduce my daughter. I was probably wearing the kind of smile I had imagined. While showing that to him, I hugged Jasmine, who ran up to me. Huh? He looked at us with his mouth agape in surprise. He probably couldn't accept the reality he had always looked down upon. Grinning just like him until a moment ago, Kate seemed unable to hide her shock. While looking at them, I spoke to Jasmine. Found a spot you want to shoot at? When I asked, Jasmine smiled brightly and nodded. I want to shoot in front of the flower bed you insisted on to the end. She pointed to the flower bed and ran towards it, picking up the equipment beside me. As I watched her tomboyish figure, Kate screamed. That's Jasmine from the video sharing site, right? Why is she calling you mom? At Kate's words, their daughter spoke up. That's right. Wow, meeting the real deal. Hey, can I get an autograph? That's a good idea, Laura. You really are a genius. Impressed by their arrogant attitude, true to their nature as parent and child, I shrugged my shoulders and firmly declined. Sorry, but you can't. Jasmine does video posting voluntarily. She enjoys shooting and editing. It's not about being famous. Sure, she's become well-known, but that's not what she wants to do. Well, it wouldn't hurt, right? After all, Laura is a genius. A combination of a popular person and a genius makes a good story. Listening to William proudly proclaiming his daughter's genius, I asked, Weary, what exactly makes your daughter a genius? So far, I only see a lack of common sense and arrogance. How dare you say that? Laura has a lot of things to be good at. I wanted to see concrete examples of her genius, but found nothing specific in Kate's claims, causing me to sigh. Seeing that, William displeased with my attitude began to brag more about Laura. You know, Laura never sticks to anything. Too much of a genius, she masters everything too quickly. She's tried so many hobbies but gets bored as soon as she excels. Oh boy, the troubles of having a genius child. Hearing what hardly sounded like a boast, I grew tired. Without much response to his bragging, I moved towards where Jasmine was filming. 
Behind me, William's family were saying something, but I ignored them and called out to my daughter. Jasmine, how's the shooting going? Let's go to a cafe when you're done. Jasmine was surrounded by a crowd of people watching her film. Some of them seemed to realize she was Jasmine, making the scene quite lively. Just need to shoot the ending, and we're done. Hang on a bit longer. She cheerfully answered, waving to the people around her before starting the final scene. Hey, Jasmine. Film with me. In an oblivious moment, Laura interrupted the filming. Noticing it, Jasmine smiled at Laura and resumed shooting. After finally finishing, Jasmine found herself encircled by onlookers. Like Laura, they asked for autographs, but she politely declined. Instead, she chatted and interacted joyfully with those who approached her. She was continuing her activities because she enjoyed them, not because she wanted fame. Despite her fame, she never boasted about it. Of course, she hadn't thought about giving autographs, so she couldn't offer one. Then, it would be good to communicate a bit as a way of returning the favor to those who approached her. That's what Jasmine has been thinking and acting on. Laura had interrupted her earlier, but Jasmine wanted to maintain her composure in fact. I wonder if Laura really understood Jasmine's gentle refusal. After finishing conversations with most people, Jasmine was about to leave, Laura approached her predictably. She didn't understand Jasmine's intentions. The filming's done, right? So, film with me next. Seeing Jasmine staring at Laura in astonishment, I couldn't hold back and intervened. Sorry, but Jasmine doesn't do collaborations. That smile earlier was just a polite response to your interruption during filming. What's that, pleasantries? Learning such things as a child, aren't you raising her wrong? Kate interjected sarcastically, looking down at Jasmine with crossed arms. Jasmine briefly frowned but remained silent, not retorting to Kate. Seeing that, Kate became more confident and pressed further. So, are you saying Laura isn't worth filming with? Laura can do anything, she's a genius. It's actually an opportunity to enhance your image. Why don't you read the situation better? Overwhelmed by that, Jasmine looked at me for guidance. Receiving her gaze, I sighed and replied to Kate, enough already. You keep calling your daughter a genius, but there's not a single concrete example. Isn't there something more substantial to boast about? As I said it, the people around us, who had been listening to our conversation, agreed. Pressed by their words, Kate made a displeased face, but Laura seemed unfazed. Instead, she proudly boasted about her accomplishments. I got an award at a piano recital. It was for practicing well. And also, at dance school for learning a whole song. I also got an award for never missing school. I've been awarded a lot. Laura was at least over grade 7. Thinking about it, her statements seemed awkward, to say the least. Unaware of that, Laura looked at us expectantly for praise. I exchanged a troubled look with Jasmine, and we could only make helpless faces. The people around us seemed to feel the same, with some even bursting into laughter. Even Kate seemed to read the atmosphere and tried to change the subject forcibly. By the way, since you're active like this, how much do you earn? You can't possibly afford to live in a condo like this, can you? Her question seemed desperate, but I decided to reply to avoid rehashing the atmosphere. Thankfully, we're quite popular on the video sharing site. Of course, we earn an income, but it's saved for Jasmine's future and for buying necessary filming equipment. Sure, this condo is attractive, but we have a house, so we don't need it. Besides, I was part of creating this place, so the success fee is substantial. My current husband runs a company, and combined with his income, moving here wouldn't be a bad idea. I told her everything she might have wanted to know. Predictably, Kate looked displeased and glared at Jasmine and me. Hearing my story, William seemed too surprised to retort. Whereas, Kate was ever bold, and tried to ingratiate herself with me. So, you created this place. Then, with just a word from you, we could live here, right? Our kids are about the same age, so out of kindness, could you help us? I couldn't understand what she meant by kindness, but I had no intention of agreeing. Just as I was about to firmly refuse, Laura asked eagerly by misunderstanding something.
Can you really help us live in this condo? We want to live here. Please. At her words, I sighed deeply in exasperation. I decided to set the record straight for once and all. Sorry, but I can't guarantee you can live here. Sure, I might be able to refer you to the management company with my connections, but there are screenings. Things like what job you do, your income, and your prospects. I'm not in charge of the screenings, so it's not guaranteed. It's up to you, so good luck with that. Hearing that, Kate made her face, while Laura didn't seem to fully understand. Then William butted in, making an unreasonable demand. My daughter's asking, so make it happen. If you have the connections for creating this place, get us through the screening. Everyone around whispered at his absurd demand. I pondered how to explain the obvious fact, my head aching. You can't just interfere in the screening process, can you? That's obviously out of my jurisdiction. If you want to live here, overcome it with your own efforts. When I said that, William suddenly became enraged and started to rampage. He began ripping out the flowers from the nearby flower bed and throwing them at me. I stood in the way to protect Jasmine from getting hit while scolding him. However, for some reason, Kate and Laura followed his lead and started doing the same. Furthermore, while hurling the flowers, Kate shouted insults at us, and Laura hurled verbal abuse at Jasmine. I was busy protecting Jasmine, but people around us started to intervene to stop them. Nonetheless, the three of them refused to listen and kept throwing anything they could grab. Kate picked up a stone lying nearby and was about to throw it. I grabbed her arm to stop her from hitting Jasmine, but Kate carried away and pushed me. Thus, I fell into the flower bed, hitting my head. Seeing that, people around us condemned them more vehemently and tried desperately to stop them. Yet, the three of them continued to act wildly and were soon restrained. Someone had called the police, though I didn't know who, and they arrived upon hearing the commotion. Who called the cops? As the police officers restrained him, William shouted, but no one responded. Kate also was restrained by the police and tried to find out who had reported them. Laura stopped her tantrum but began crying upon seeing her parents being held by the police. The noisy scene was suddenly overtaken by the commanding voice of a police officer. You're under arrest for obstructing official duties. With those words, the place became silent instantly. It seemed William had attacked a police officer and was being arrested on the spot. Holding my head and hugging Jasmine, who was close to tears, I watched the scene unfold. As William was taken away, Kate and Laura were also escorted to the police station. The three of them were put in a police car and gradually disappeared from view. After such a huge uproar caused by William's family, I felt drained as they were easily taken away by the police. Meanwhile, I came to myself by Jasmine's desperate yell. Mom, you're hurt. Should we go to the hospital? Otherwise, you will. Affected by the chaos, Jasmine finally burst into tears. I hugged her, apologizing for involving her in such an incident. The people around us also expressed their concern, making me feel cared for. Though I was in pain, the fact that Jasmine was safe made it seem insignificant. Every time someone asked, I assured them I was fine, and soon the sound of an ambulance siren was heard. Apparently, someone had called an ambulance as well. When the ambulance arrived, I was taken away with the police officers. As I boarded the ambulance with Jasmine, I glanced back at the flower bed where the flowers had been torn out. As being involved in the construction of a large condominium, I had wanted to mitigate its oppressive presence. So, I established a park on the property and planted flower beds there. I hoped the park would become a place of rest and foster enjoyable conversations. I met my current husband in a park, taking a break from work and admiring the flower beds. He approached me, and we started talking, eventually becoming close. Initially, we only met during lunch breaks but gradually we began dining out and eventually married. Soon after, we were blessed with Jasmine, and despite it being a late pregnancy, she was born safely. That park with the flower beds had brought me happiness. Therefore, in the projects I was involved in, I wanted to create opportunities for others to find happiness. That was the idea behind that flower bed. Its destruction saddened me deeply, and I was quite shocked. Upon reaching the hospital, treatment began immediately, and I needed a few stitches. Thankfully, it wasn't visible, much to my relief. Seeing it, Jasmine seemed reassured, 
and by the time we left the hospital, she was smiling again. While waiting for the bill, I was questioned by the police and decided to file a complaint. I also decided to hire a lawyer and ensure that William's family faced appropriate consequences. Thanks to that, Kate was arrested for assault. According to the lawyer, with her parents in police custody, Laura was taken in by Kate's parents. I thought that was unfortunate enough, but she was in for strict re-education from her grandparents. Taken in by her grandparents, she was apparently reprimanded and criticized greatly for her usual behavior. Due to her young age, it seems she is being disciplined strictly for rehabilitation. It will likely lead to challenging days ahead for not only William and Kate but also for Laura. As for me, my injury has been healing well since then. I had the stitches removed recently, so there's no significant injury anymore. Jasmine has become even more popular since that day and has been busy. It turns out that it was one of her followers who called the police and ambulance. After the filming ended, sensing the tense atmosphere, Jasmine quickly switched to live streaming. Thanks to that, when the brawl escalated, one of her followers took action. We are truly grateful for that, as it helped bring the situation under control. Afterward, Jasmine wanted to thank the person and made a call out in a video, but no one came forward. So, we decided to post another video expressing our gratitude. When we went to film the video at the park where the disturbance occurred, we found the flower bed beautifully restored. Apparently, volunteers had fixed it up after the incident, which was a relief. Since then, things have been going surprisingly well. My work on the condominium has led to an increased evaluation of my job. I've been promoted and now am the head of the planning department. Jasmine's video views have skyrocketed, and she continues to post videos joyfully. My current husband is very concerned about us and has been quite worried. Though I'm fully healed and there are no hindrances to my life, he still occasionally checks on my injury. I'm really happy to be with the kind-hearted husband and Jasmine grow up healthy. There are no problems in my work or family life. I look forward to spending more happy times with three of us. I'm in Charleston right now, what do you want for a souvenir? What? Charleston? Are you that far away and coming back today? I'm staying in Charleston today, heading to Savannah in Georgia tomorrow, and planning to return the night after tomorrow. Is Jackson with you? What about work? Jackson and Lily are off today and tomorrow, and they took the day after off work too. Lily's there too? Yeah, it's a family trip. So, I'm counting on you to house sit lol. Mason left for a trip with Jackson and Lily, leaving me behind. This was problematic enough, but Mason had another issue up his sleeve. Also, you're handling the trip expenses lol. What do you mean? I borrowed a credit card from your wallet. You did what? I've been patient with Mason, but this was unforgivable. However, when I checked my wallet, my anger quickly subsided, and I burst into laughter. Actually, that credit card is LOL. What? Mason is about to have a very unpleasant time. And after returning from the trip, a hellish scenario awaits him. I'm Emma, a 56-year-old office worker, and my husband Mason is 57 and works part-time. You might wonder why I married a part-timer like Mason, but he wasn't always one. Mason was laid off at 30 during a company downsizing. I thought Mason would find a new job quickly, but he had a proposal for me. Our babies do soon. I've been thinking, what if I become a house husband until childcare settles down a bit? That way, Emma, you can return to work smoothly. For a few years, you mean? Mason, are you sure about taking such a long break? Even if my return to work is smooth, won't it be hard for you to find a job later? I've gained some experience and skills so far. The layoff and birth coincided. Childcare can be a legitimate reason for a career gap. It might affect my job search, but I think I can manage it with some effort. Probably, Mason was right, considering his view. I know Mason has always been diligent at work. His layoff wasn't due to a lack of ability, but simply bad luck. All right, but you have to do the housework properly and get back to work once childcare settles down. I agreed to Mason's proposal, albeit with some reservations. However, this decision led to a turn for the worse. 
When our son Jackson was born, Mason kept his promise and worked hard at both housework and childcare. Thanks to that, I could return to work smoothly and focus on my job. But as Jackson turned three, Mason and I often clashed over parenting. Are you giving Jackson sweets again? He won't eat his meals, you know? And you bought him another toy, right? You're spoiling him too much. What can I do? Jackson wants sweets and toys. Should I make him suffer? That's just cruel. Learning to wait is important. What if he becomes a spoiled brat who can't handle not getting his way? Mom's angry again. She says no to sweets and toys. I don't like mom. Since I'm working and Mason is a house husband, Jackson spends more time with Mason. And Mason, spoiling Jackson, has made him a complete ally. It's sad not having my child on my side, but given the situation, it can't be helped. But apart from parenting, there was another issue. Mason, you didn't clean up the lunch dishes again? I'm busy with childcare. You wouldn't understand, being at work all day. I get that you're busy, but this happens every day. I end up washing and cleaning up after work. Can't you at least soak them? They're always dry and hard to wash. Mom's being fussy again. Scary, huh? I don't like mom. Mason gradually stopped doing housework. Cooking, cleaning, laundry, he left everything halfway, and I ended up doing it all. I never intended to dump all the housework on Mason, just because he's a house husband. I used to help out, but Mason grew dependent on my assistance and eventually stopped doing anything. Well, Jackson's starting preschool soon, and it's about time for Mason to look for a job. Maybe he's just cherishing his time with Jackson before work starts. Thinking this, I stopped nagging Mason about housework and childcare. But even when Jackson started preschool and then elementary school, Mason didn't start job hunting. Hey, Mason. Jackson's 10 now. Isn't it about time you start looking for a job? He's still only 10. Besides, if I start working, Jackson will be home alone till night. Don't you think that's sad? That's why I said we should practice leaving him alone for a bit. But you said it wasn't necessary because you're home and never let Jackson practice staying alone. I can't leave Jackson alone. On the surface, it might seem like Mason is saying the right things. But I know better from his past actions. Mason is just using Jackson as an excuse because he doesn't want to work. He used to be diligent before being laid off, but it seems he's grown accustomed to not working and doesn't want to start again. Moreover, I'm just a regular office worker and I don't earn that much. I understand you don't want to leave Jackson alone, Mason. But you know living off my salary alone is getting tough. Our savings we had until we were about 30 are dwindling. If this continues, we might not be able to afford food. Okay, I get it. But still, leaving Jackson alone. How about you work part-time while Jackson is at school? That's reasonable, right? Mason, reluctant to work, finally agreed to my suggestion and started working part-time. With Mason working part-time and us living frugally, we managed to escape the deficit. Though problems remain, at least for now, we can live a little more comfortably. But when Jackson became a high schooler, our problems increased. Mason, where's this month's money? What? I already gave it to you. There's no way it's this little. Once Jackson started working part-time in high school, he began buying his own things. It's embarrassing as a parent, but it gave us a little more breathing room in our budget. I thought we could even start saving a small amount, but Mason stopped contributing financially, plunging us back into hardship. It soon became clear what Mason was spending his money on. What's this? It's fine. Got it cheap from someone I know. A motorcycle? That's cool. Where did we have the room in our budget for this? I was speechless. Later, Jackson graduated from high school, worked for a while, and moved out at 22. However, he lived nearby and always came home on weekends. 
Dad, where are we going today? There's a famous pizza place in the mountains. Let's go there. Mason completely stopped doing housework. He and Jackson, having been inseparable since Jackson was young, were like friends. Now, influenced by Mason, Jackson rides motorcycles too, and they often leave me behind on weekends to go on rides. Well, I find it easier when they're not around, so it's fine by me. Dad, why did you marry Mom, who's so uninteresting? Why indeed? I totally chose the wrong person to marry, lol. I've become numb to overhearing such conversations. Jackson, at 26, got married. His wife, Lily, unlike Jackson, isn't the type to ride motorcycles around. She's more serious and hardworking, a bit like me. I've heard men are often attracted to women who resemble their mothers. Maybe Jackson subconsciously chose someone like me. Dad, where are we going today? There's a new fast food place. Want to check it out? Even after getting married, Jackson continued to go out with Mason on weekends. I wonder if it's okay to leave his new wife, Lily, like that. Maybe Lily tolerates it because, unlike Mason, Jackson does work properly. Don't you ever get complaints for not taking mom along? Nope, never lol. Even if she did, I'd ignore her because she's a buzzkill lol. Do they not realize their conversation can be heard inside the house? Their usual banter continues. I've become so numb to it, I hardly react anymore. I usually don't pay much attention to Mason and Jackson, but one day something happened that I couldn't overlook. One weekend morning, I woke up to Mason preparing to go out early. Assuming it was just another outing with Jackson, I went back to sleep. When I woke up again and checked outside, the motorcycle was gone. They must have left early as usual. I was spending my day at home when Mason called in the afternoon. I'm in Charleston, what souvenir would you like? What? Charleston? Can you make it back today? We're staying in Charleston today, touring Savannah in Georgia tomorrow, and planning to return the night after tomorrow. Mason and Jackson often ride out on the motorcycle, but they always return the same day. Staying overnight is new. Is Jackson with you? What about work on Monday? Jackson and Lily are off today and tomorrow, and they took the day after off. Wait, Lily's there too? Yeah, so it's a family trip. So, I'm counting on you to house sit lol. It's not unusual for Mason and Jackson to leave me behind. But I was astounded they took Lily. Did she willingly go on this trip? While I was wrestling with these worries, Mason dropped a bombshell. Also, you're covering the trip expenses lol. What do you mean? I borrowed a credit card from your wallet lol. You did what? To think, a thief in the family. It's so disheartening. I've been somewhat indifferent towards Mason because he was spending his own salary. But using my credit card, our household money, is unforgivable. Does he have any idea how hard I worked to keep us afloat? I hurried to check my wallet. Then, my anger vanished, replaced by laughter. The card you took wasn't the black one, but the silver one, right? Yes. Do you have any cash with you? You don't have your own credit card, do you? I have about $200 or so. Why? That's not enough for a three-day trip. You'll have to ask Jackson to cover the rest. Emma, what are you talking about? Well, about that credit card, lol it seems to be damaged, lol. When I had to tell Mason, who was out having a good time without me, about the truth, I almost laughed, my voice shook, and my words even came out funny. What? What's wrong with this credit card? It's not broken. This credit card, it seems to have a magnetic malfunction or something, it can't be read lol. Why do you even have such a credit card? Didn't my wallet have two credit cards? I manage my money by separating fixed and variable expenses. The one you took is for fixed expenses like utilities and subscription services. I realized it was damaged when I tried to use it by mistake, but since it's not used for reading at supermarkets or restaurants, I didn't bother reissuing it. What? So, this credit card is useless? That's right. Wait. 
I told Jackson and Lily that I'd pay for the hotel and meals with this card. How can I tell them it's actually unusable? It's embarrassing. Mason intended to show off with someone else's money. It's another pathetic tale. I don't know. Maybe you can figure something out with your $200? Don't forget the souvenirs. Mason was still fussing on the other end, but I ignored him and hung up. I was alone until Mason returned from the trip. I decided to fully enjoy my time without Mason. Two days later, in the evening, Mason returned home a bit earlier than planned. Emma, what were you thinking? Do you have any idea how terrible our situation was? Yeah, make sure you pay back the money for the trip. It seemed Jackson and Lily were with him. Mason and Jackson started venting their unreasonable anger towards me from the entrance, even though they hadn't seen me yet. My peaceful time alone was over. I slowly made my way to the entrance. Stop making a scene at the entrance, come inside first. I ushered Mason, Jackson, and Lily into the house and arranged us around the table, with Mason and Jackson facing me and Lily. Mason and Jackson were frowning and crossing their arms, looking angry. Lily also looked displeased. Keeping a damaged credit card, even though you're always on my case about things. Even you can't manage your own stuff, Emma. Make sure you pay back the money I fronted for the trip. We went because you said you'd pay for the expenses. I was exasperated by Mason's irrelevant arguments and Jackson's fixation on money. There were too many things to address, I didn't even know where to start. Mason and Jackson continued to complain at me. As I was trying to decide what to say, Lily suddenly burst out angrily. Jackson! Enough already! It's embarrassing! Why are you getting mad? Lily's sudden outburst left Mason and Jackson confused. However, since Lily and I probably have similar personalities, I had an inkling of what was going on. I was certain of it when Lily got furious. Don't you two get why Lily is angry? What? You understand, Emma? Lily doesn't like motorcycles like Mason and Jackson. Being dragged around on the back of a motorcycle for hours must have been hard for her. Plus, it's not enjoyable to have your FIL tag along on what's supposed to be a couple's trip, not to mention being forced to take off work and ending up with a stolen credit card that doesn't work. That must have been tough for Lily. Am I right? Yes, that's pretty much it. Lily, what are you talking about? You always complain about wanting to go places, so I took you. Lily didn't want that. You just forced her to join your hobby. She just agreed with what I said. To add to what I said earlier, I thought she was also part of this trip. She was left behind, right? I can't forgive that either. Lily glared at Mason and Jackson, who awkwardly looked away. It seems Lily's sullenness wasn't about my credit card being unusable, but rather directed at Mason and Jackson's selfishness. Jackson, I've decided. I want a divorce, and since both your parents are here, I'm saying it now. What? Why all of a sudden? It's not sudden. It's okay for you to go out with Mason, but you always spend a lot and don't do anything at home. I just wanted a bit of our time, a little consideration for our relationship. You don't understand that at all, and I don't see a future in this. Dad does the same, and he's not divorced from mom. Jackson, you're following the wrong example. Apparently, Jackson was too influenced by Mason and became just like him. Lily's grievances with Jackson were the same as mine with Mason. The difference between me and Lily is that she decided to leave Jackson within a year. Lily's declaration of divorce gave me courage. I support Lily's decision to divorce. Accept it, Jackson. Emma, what are you thinking? Not supporting your own son and agreeing to a divorce? Also, I want a divorce too. What? My sudden declaration of divorce surprised all three of them. The word divorce, which I had never even considered, came out impulsively, and I was shocked by my own statement. The behavior of Mason and Jackson must have unconsciously pushed me to my limits. 
that's how it is, so you two go back to Jackson's house. Lily, stay here for now. With unstoppable momentum, I sent Mason and Jackson out of the house. Lily, shall we proceed with the divorce proceedings together? Feel free to use this house until the divorce is finalized. Thank you. Lily was confused by the unexpected turn of events. However, having a common adversary, we quickly bonded and started working together towards the divorce. Afterward, Jackson and Lily quickly finalized their divorce, and although it took longer for me and Mason, we eventually managed to divorce as well. Once Jackson and Lily's divorce was settled, Lily moved out of the house. Though we lived together for only a month, it was surprisingly enjoyable, and we still keep in touch. When my divorce was finalized, Mason and Jackson started living together, and I left the house. Mason began job hunting to support himself, but having worked only part-time for nearly 30 years, finding a full-time job at almost 60 seemed unlikely. He's still working part-time. Jackson continues his job, but at 27, his income isn't substantial. As a result, Mason and Jackson appear to be living a deficit life, planning to move into a small, cheap apartment together. This situation will likely make Mason realize how hard I had to work to manage our life, and Jackson will understand the challenges of living with Mason. I started living alone after leaving the house. Now, I can spend my earnings solely on myself. Today, I bought a cake on my way home from work. Such luxury was unimaginable in my previous life, but now I am enjoying my days. You know, I remarried a beautiful and young woman unlike you. My ex-husband Duke said to me with a vulgar smile. It's only been a week since our divorce, and he's already remarried. He probably was cheating on me even while we were married. For a while after we got married, Duke and I were a happy couple. We both loved kids and were conscious about having them right from the start of our marriage. I can't wait to have kids. I want a daughter and a son. Duke would say excitedly, imagining our future. But we struggled to conceive. Gradually, our relationship soured, and we ended up hating each other and divorced. A week later, I ran into him at a shopping mall, where I went to distract myself. My name is Lynn. A woman in her 30s and a corporate employee. I met Duke, who's four years older than me, through friends. And got married three years ago. Duke and I both loved kids and wanted to start a family early. I really hope we have kids soon. I'd like a daughter and a son. Duke used to say. Yeah, I don't mind the gender as long as they're healthy. But I do want more than two. I would respond. We happily talked about what our kids might look like, what their personalities would be like eagerly awaiting their arrival. However, even after one year, then two, we couldn't conceive. During the first year, Duke said, It didn't work out again. But no rush, we'll be fine. But after the second year, he started to become bitter. What, it didn't work out again? Someone I know had a baby just two months after getting married. Why can't we have one? He complained. I don't know what to say. Our relationship deteriorated from that point. Duke's behavior became harsher, and I couldn't handle it alone anymore. I often confided in my best friend Johanna. Johanna always listened seriously to my problems. I see. Duke really wants a child, so I understand his disappointment. But he should be more considerate of you. She said sympathetically. I know. He's changed so much. He used to be so kind. I said, reminiscing about the old Duke and sighing deeply. Johanna and I shared our deepest troubles with each other, things we couldn't tell anyone else. Time passed, and we still couldn't have children. Before we knew it, three years of marriage had gone by. Realizing that natural conception might be impossible, I decided to suggest fertility treatments to Duke. After dinner and while drinking coffee, I approached Duke. Hey, Duke. We haven't had a child in three years, right? I'm 34 now, so maybe it's time to consider fertility treatments? Duke's face showed blatant annoyance at my words. 
fertility treatments? Isn't it because you're getting old and decrepit that we can't have kids? If you're gonna do it, do it alone. That's not something you can just say. I was taken aback by his harsh response and was at a loss for words. I'm not doing it. There's no way the problem is with me. Duke spat out those words and immediately left for the bedroom. Left alone, I stood there stunned. Does Duke not want to cooperate at all? I muttered, filled with a mix of emptiness and sadness. With no other choice, I decided to visit a fertility clinic alone. After a thorough examination. Where's your husband? It's important to have his cooperation. Infertility issues are often on the male side. Make sure he comes with you next time. The doctor asked. Encouraged by the doctor's words, I tried to discuss fertility treatments with Duke again that night. Fertility treatments won't work if it's just me. You need to get tested too. Can you please come to the hospital with me? Are you saying it's my fault? It's obviously you, the woman, who's the problem. I have nothing to do with it. I told you to do it alone if you're going to do it. Don't drag me into this. Duke exploded in anger. But infertility often lies on the male side. If the doctor said so, it must be true. The doctor also said that the husband needs to cooperate. Please, Duke, come to the hospital with me. I tried desperately to persuade Duke. Despite his irritation. Fine, I'll go. Just stop nagging. Duke eventually agreed, albeit grudgingly. A few days later, I took Duke to the fertility clinic. After his examination, Duke emerged from the testing room looking irritated, his face twisted in frustration. We were waiting in the reception area to hear both my previous results and Duke's recent test. Due to the clinic's busy schedule, we were not called for a while. Being impatient, Duke abruptly stood up and said, I'm leaving. He ignored my attempts to stop him and left alone. I had no choice but to hear the results alone. Finally called in, the doctor's revelation left me in shock. I need to tell Duke. I rushed home, opened the door and said, I'm back. I washed my hands and headed to the living room, where an infuriated Duke awaited. What's wrong? Hey, what are you playing at? I thought infertility testing would be simpler, but why did I have to go through that? It was humiliating. It seemed Duke was upset about the nature of the male fertility test. Well, we need to do proper tests to find out why we can't have kids. About the test results. Duke cut me off mid-sentence, shouting angrily. This is all because you're old and can't have kids. I can't take this anymore. I'm divorcing you. What are you talking about all of a sudden? I was shocked by Duke's sudden declaration of divorce and raised my voice in surprise. I can't live with an infertile old woman anymore. Fed up with Duke's abusive language and constant belittling about my infertility, I felt my feelings for him cooled in that moment. Fine. Let's divorce. Ha, huh, I'm glad you agree so easily. Get out, you infertile old woman. I silently packed my things and left the house. I decided to stay at my parents' house for a while. They welcomed me warmly, which I was very grateful for. I filled out my part of the divorce papers as soon as I got there and sent them to Duke. We had been married for three years. Duke was a kind and good husband in the beginning. There were many happy memories. But the Duke I loved was no longer there. Remembering the ugly face of Duke, who insulted and pushed for divorce, filled me with sadness and intense anger. I didn't have any love left for Duke. A week later, I went to a large shopping mall for a change of scenery. That's when I saw a familiar profile. Ugh. And I involuntarily muttered. I tried to leave unnoticed, but Duke saw me. Isn't that Lynn? Duke noticed me and called out. I ignored him and started walking away. Wait. He grabbed my arm. Let go. Duke looked at me with a vile smile. Following me? Can't forget about me, huh? What? His off-base comment left me dumbfounded. 
I've remarried a beautiful, young woman. I have no need for an infertile old woman, so disappear." Duke laughed rudely, looking down on me. The fact that he stopped me just to tell me to disappear infuriated me. It had only been a week since our divorce, but he was already remarried. I realized then that Duke must have been cheating on me. The deterioration of our marriage wasn't just because we couldn't have kids, it was also because of Duke's affair. He must have been confident about divorcing because he had the option of remarrying his mistress. What a terrible man. As I frowned, a coquettish voice caught my attention. Duke, who are you talking to? The voice belonged to a woman with blonde hair, heavy makeup, and revealing clothes. She was also adorned with designer bags and accessories and held shopping bags from brand stores. Finished shopping? This is my ex-wife. The infamous ex-wife. The woman looked down on me with a scornful gaze. I recognized her from somewhere. Who was she? I was on the verge of remembering. When Duke triumphantly introduced her. Lynn, let me introduce you. This is my wife, Pamela. Beautiful and young, right? Hi, I'm Pamela, Duke's new wife. 25 years old. At that moment, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. So, it was that Pamela. Finally remembering, I couldn't stop the laughter that welled up inside me. Seeing me laughing uproariously, Pamela and Duke looked at me with puzzled expressions. Still laughing, I told Duke. I feel sorry for you. I'm busy, so I'm going now, lol. Duke hurriedly tried to stop me as I was about to leave. Hey! What do you mean you feel sorry for me? Is that your way of admitting defeat? Admitting defeat? No way. Then what is it? Spit it out. Duke asked irritably. All right, I'll tell you. I turned to Pamela. I know who you are. I said. What? I don't know a dull, uninteresting, old woman like you. Pamela retorted, looking puzzled. What a rude thing to say. I asked Pamela coldly. Do you know a woman named Johanna? Johanna? Ah. It seemed she remembered. Pamela's face turned pale. Johanna? Isn't she Lynn's best friend? What does Pamela have to do with Johanna? Duke asked anxiously. I declared. She's the bar employee who tricked Johanna's boyfriend into spending money on her. And she dumped him the moment he ran out of money. What? Duke's eyes widened in disbelief. I heard from Johanna that her boyfriend had been deceived and spent money on a bar employee named Pamela. Despite the bar explaining it was just part of the job, he believed they were truly in love and bought her expensive bags and designer watches. Johanna decided she didn't need a man who could be deceived by a bar employee. She had shown me a photo of this woman, Pamela. Johanna's naive boyfriend believed Pamela's seductive words, but Pamela went as far as having physical relationships outside the bar and even checking houses to live after they were married. And there were multiple men she did this to. It wasn't just Johanna's boyfriend. You seem to have manipulated several men, a trade company executive, a small construction company CEO, and a county administrator, right? But when they started holding back on spending, you cut ties with them. Duke, aren't you being deceived too? Are you sure you're okay? That's a lie. There's no way that's true. You're just making up lies because you're bitter, aren't you? Stop kidding around. Duke was furious, refusing to listen to my warning. Exactly. I would never do such a thing. I don't even know who Johanna is, and I've never made her boyfriend spend money on me. Everything you're saying is a lie. You're just jealous because I'm beautiful, right? Pamela confidently lied and shouted back at me. That's right. Lynn is just jealous of Pamela and making up stories, right? Infertile old hag you are, so ugly. Infertile old hag, that's funny. You're truly pathetic. Go away, you old woman. Taking advantage of my silence, Pamela and Duke unleashed a barrage of insults at me. Finding the situation ridiculous, I said. You don't have to believe me. I truly don't care about Duke anymore. 
Anyway, I wish you happiness. And left the scene. From behind me. It's all lies, right? Pamela, you're not deceiving me, are you? Followed by Pamela's voice. Of course, it's a lie. Believe in me. Everything that old woman said was a lie. I heard. A few days later, I met Johanna and told her about the incident. Pamela remarried Duke. I was shocked when I heard you divorce Duke, but I never imagined he would marry that woman. Johanna was visibly surprised, her eyes and mouth wide open. Yes, it's true. It's a small world, isn't it? Indeed. But Duke, he's going to suffer. Knowing how Duke had treated me, Johanna smiled as if feeling relieved. I think Duke will end up in a miserable situation. Right now, he's completely infatuated with her. We laughed together. Some time later. After work, I was about to head home as usual. Suddenly. Lynn. I heard a listless voice from behind. I was startled and turned around to see Duke standing there. What do you want? Don't scare me like that. What are you doing here? Lend me some money. What? Duke looked much thinner than before, almost haggard. With sunken cheeks and eyes. His wrinkled clothes made him appear pitiful. I could guess the situation from his appearance and request. So, you're exhausted in every way because of that Pamela. Exactly. Just like you said. She just milked me for all I had, and the moment my savings ran out, she left me, and filed for divorce. Just as I had warned, Pamela had married Duke for his money and left him as soon as it ran out. Foolish. I warned you politely, didn't I? I should have listened carefully to what you said. You know how much I spent on her? She's the worst. Don't you think I'm a victim? I was deceived, I'm the victim here. What? His claim of being a victim was astonishing. It was all his responsibility. Because she stripped me of everything, I can't even pay this month's rent, let alone the utilities. I'm sorry to ask, but can you lend me some money for my living expenses? If this continues, I'll become homeless. Duke's blatant opportunism left me utterly dismayed. Actually, I want to get back together with you, Lynn. Please reconcile with me. I realized your worth after being deceived by Pamela. Marry me again. It's a lifetime request. Marry me again. Duke begged tearfully. I looked at him coldly. Sorry, but I refuse. What? Why? Why? Have you forgotten how you treated me? I don't like you at all anymore. I hate you so much I don't even want to see your face. There's no chance of us getting back together. Duke turned red with rage. How dare you talk to me like that? I'm offering to reconcile with you, an infertile woman. Be grateful. Hearing Duke's words, I laughed. Why are you laughing? I just thought how mistaken you are, lol. Mistaken. Duke asked, puzzled. The infertility issue wasn't with me, it was with you, Duke. What? Duke was speechless. You left the hospital without hearing the test results. I was going to tell you that night, but you started talking about divorce and never listened. The results showed you have almost no fertility, and natural conception is almost impossible. I, on the other hand, had no issues. That's a lie. It can't be true. There's no way I'm the cause of infertility. It's definitely you. Duke ranted, refusing to believe. I've never been sick, so how can I be infertile? It must be you. If you think it's a lie, go to the hospital and hear it yourself. I replied calmly. Is it true? No, it can't be. I can't be infertile. Duke was in total disarray, sweating profusely. He never thought the issue was with him. So, go and hear it directly from the doctor. If you plan to marry someone else in the future, it's better to know about your body. I said and left. Duke went to the clinic. And learned the truth about his infertility. 
He called me several times, but I ignored them all. He then left voicemails. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Let's start over. Answer the phone. Please. I have no money. I'm in deep debt. Help me, Lynn. I deleted all his messages and blocked his phone number. A few days after blocking him, I was ambushed by Duke in front of my office. Lynn, please. Even if we don't reconcile, just lend me some money. I'm not asking for much, just $10,000, no, even $5,000 will do. Please. We were married once, right? Duke pleaded with deep apologies. Stop this right here. I'm not lending you any money. Go back right now, or I'll call the police. Even as I warned him, Duke persisted. Just lend me the money. So, I really called the police to deal with him. Perhaps the shock of the police being called or the fear of increased patrols deterred him. After that, he never showed up in front of me again. Duke, struggling financially and accumulating more debt, moved to a very old apartment and worked part-time at a grocery store late into the night to make ends meet. However, the strain took its toll, and he started making mistakes continuously at work. Unable to handle his main job while doing a side job, he was looked down upon and felt quite uncomfortable. Meanwhile, I've almost completely moved on from the shock of the divorce and am working energetically every day. I had relied quite a bit on my parents, but now I've moved to an apartment near my company and am enjoying living alone without any concerns. Recently, Johanna and I went on a long-planned trip where I met a man and started dating him. It was a long-distance relationship, but last month he got transferred to a branch near my home. He asked me, Would you like to get married? So, it looks like I'm going to be quite busy from now on.